All right, so we are finishing, literally finishing up our section this week on the doctrine of the attributes of God. Uh, we have two sections left, D and E. Um, 26. Uh, yeah, page 26. So that's, uh, I think it's 6. Yeah, section 6. So last week we talked in, about God's attributes. And remember we said last week that some of God's attributes humanity has in fraction, right? So we are made in the image of God, so we, we share some of the things with God, but not to the extent that God has them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we said God is omnipotent, right? We can know things. We, we have brains that allow us to do things that, you know, nothing else in the animal kingdom can do, right? right. But then again, God is all-knowing. Right, God is omnipresent. He's all places at once. He's omniscient. Um, he knows all things. Omnipotent is all powerful. Excuse me. Um, and so this week we're finishing off with D and E. And D. Good morning, Alan. D is God is eternal, not limited by what? Time. Time. Good. Some Christian thinkers have thought. This means that God is timeless, a God who watches the unfolding drama of human history from outside or above time as a spectator watches a play from a balcony, personally unaffected by and uninvolved in what is happening on the stage. But is this the God we see in the scriptures? So what does it mean that God is not limited by time? So to begin with, time is what? I mean, who came up with the concept of time? We did, I guess. We did. Right. Yeah, time is a human construct, right? Uh, I don't know if it was the Protestants who felt, you know, uh, you know, idleness is a devil's work, you know, get to, I mean, not the Protestant work <laughs> ethic. Who knows? But, you know, time is a human construct, right? We, well, it's our description of what happens, but I mean, sure. we're definitely going through time. <laughs> yeah, we just it, figured I mean, out how to measure it. Right, 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 but right. I mean, I mean, it's not something that if we hadn't made it up, it wouldn't. We wouldn't die. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Nice. But, but is that? But is that the sole reason for keeping time? Uh, I, I, that, <laughs> I was just saying that. Yes, we, I agree. We, we didn't. I, and you know. I'm not saying time is a bad thing. I'm just saying that it's something that we. Yeah. It, it's a human thing. Um, so whether we figure it out by natural observation with, you know, we go around the sun or, uh, as, uh, the Roman Catholic Church for many, many centuries said, the sun goes around us, um, <laughs> poor Galileo, <laughs> um, but, yeah, so, and we also tend to think on a very linear right. model, right, you know, we're born, we die, we do a lot of stuff in between, right? So we, we do. So we must understand when we think about God, God is not limited by this time to where is God doesn't act necessarily play by these rules um, when it comes to our understanding of time. Uh, now that could mean quite a bit of things. Um, the scriptures say, you know, in some places that a day is like, I don't know, 100 a days, years. a thousand years to God. Um, a thousand years is a day. Yeah, so what exactly does that mean for God? Uh, some theologians like to think that um, God's concept of time is more cyclical, right? Is more of a, is more circular than it is linear, right? To say that it's, um, it doesn't move from point to point. Um, so this one is, is more up in the air, but I think the point that Guthrie is, is trying to make is that God is not constrained by the concept of time. Have you ever seen Interstellar? Is that the one with Matthew McConaughey? Yeah. Yeah. Where he gets into that Tesseract at the end. Yes. Is that is that the library? What? Yeah. That building? Yeah. It's, it's a... I mean, it's a black hole. It's a Tesseract. Yeah, he's, he's right. Okay. He's basically outside of time, and he's talking to his daughter as a young girl, although his daughter is now actually She's the one with a the grand books. woman. She's the one She's with the, the books. one and he's trying to tell her what the Right. Yes. Right. And uh yeah, I don't know. I thought it was 
that definitely made me think of one potential conception of yeah you know uh, being outside outside of time, of time. Mm-hmm. you know um, yeah yeah it it's 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 almost hard for us to to grasp impossible probably yeah. because we <laughs> all are we all are part of this worldview or idea it's, it's like yeah it's like uh, hey fish, tell me about living on dry land. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah, right, 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 right. Exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, we, it's it's all we know is is this linear progression that right is you know it's I'm all it's what we know. Time. Right, exactly, exactly. I I love the the I don't know if it's a it's a quip or I don't know. You two has it one of their songs where it says. A woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, it's just it's just to say, you know, she would be just plain old fine without one of us. You yeah, know, the feminist slogan from the sixties. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a neat it's a neat thing. But does God, you know, God is not constrained by the time that that we are constrained by. So what exactly does that look like? You know, I think a good part of that is mysterious. I think we don't understand. I don't yeah. think we can wrap our hands beyond around this. It's beyond our comprehension. Uh, and again, th- this is what I was talking about last week when I was saying that <coughs> when we think about God's attributes, we have some of these in fraction, you know, like in, in partially. Mm-hmm. You know, we do have the ability where we could <coughs> sit and think um, and sit and, and ponder these things, but sometimes all we do is give ourselves headaches. You know, it's just <laughs> like, um, you know, when we think about, you know, trying to figure out what God's limitations are. Does God have limitations? You know, it's, you know, and, and the only thing that we've come up with as Reformed theologians is that God typically does not do things that are outside of God's nature. Right. You know, so that seems to be the only thing, but is that a limitation or is that just God's nature. Is that just what God decides to do or not do? Right. Yeah. Um, the I was kind of reading a theology book a while ago. I forget the exact, but uh, another kind of similar to that is that um, God works within limitations, but He created those limitations. So yeah. kind of the same, you know, yeah. tomato tomato kind of thing. Yeah. You know, it's no different than someone having a mantra or someone having, like, a personal code to say that, you know, this I don't do. Um, You know, I always think of, like, you know, Buddhist monks who say, you know, we don't kill, you know, at all. You know, so, you know, they they won't kill a housefly or, you know, they are, they bind themselves by these rules. Um, So, okay, so... That's one thing, or D is God is eternal, not limited by time. Um, But God is related to us, right? So that's, we must be careful not to think that um, God is merely watching from afar, right? Because God is involved, but not affected by time. All right, E, God is unchangeable, immutable, and immovable, immovable. God is a God in whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. For I, the Lord, do not change. Some would interpret this as God predetermining our lives, or God was predetermined, or that God can never do anything different or change God's mind about an issue. But is this truly what the Bible is speaking of? Does God change? But God, uh, God does change, but God's essence does not. Now, this one is... Um, and of course, this is my opinion, uh, my interpretation as every theologian or <coughs> person, laity, has their own interpretation. But um, this one, in my opinion, has been misinterpreted many ways. Um, because we think that God is unchangeable. God does not change. Many people say, well, God, God doesn't change God's mind. Well, I could point them to lots of places in the Bible where God does right, change that's, God's mind. Like already says. Literally <laughs> says, okay, you made a good point. Right. I'm not going to waste yeah. these people. Um, perfect example, Jonah, right? right. Uh, God is all, he's happy with the concept. 
of wiping out Nineveh, right? Jonah preaches, well, eventually <laughs> preaches to the people, thinking that they're going to receive God's wrath. Jonah preaches, the whole city repents, even the livestock. Um, God's like, this is fantastic. I'm not going to destroy Nineveh, right? God changes God's mind. How many times in the wilderness does God say, I've had enough of these Israelites. <laughs> I'm getting rid of these people. And Moses goes to bat. Please, please, one more chance, one more chance. You know, I know, I know they could be a little bit unruly, but let me have one more crack at this. All right, all right. One more time. You know, but you see this. Um, God does change God's mind. Uh, with some of these concepts, we can fall into this mode or pit that we try to pigeonhole God. So instead of trying to say, well, what does this mean? We get this concept, well, God is unchangeable, therefore God doesn't change God's mind. And then we end up pigeonholing God. Well, we can change our minds. Why couldn't God change yeah. God's mind? You know, that's, that's, it's not a weakness to, to review a situation and say, right. okay, you know, you made a good point. Um, what Guthrie says, and what many of the Reformed theologians say, it's God does change, God can change, God does change God's mind at times, but it is God's essence that does not change. That is what is unchangeable, immutable, and immovable. And the ground rules don't change. Right. The ground rules are still there. Eternal truths. Are Eternal truths. Yeah. Exactly. God will always be all-knowing, all-powerful, right? Omnipresent, all over the place, um, not affected by time, right? That's it. Those do not change. The essence of God is always the same. Um, <coughs> But God does change things up, you know, throughout the Bible. And that, you know, we cannot ignore that. Um, you know, he, God will at times move to a different, I don't want to use the term strategy, but, um, you know, you, we have different covenants, right? And then Jesus comes. You can't, you know, that's a huge shift, right? And not only is it a shift to say, okay, well, now God comes incarnate as a human, but what happens, right? One system of curses and blessings is now finished. And now it's a system of grace. That's a change. That's a huge change. Thank God for that. You know, that's literally. a... Literally. <laughs> that's a huge change, right? It's a wonderful change. And it is a change, right? So it's not that God does not change. It's not that God doesn't come up with ideas that are different or fresh. It's the core about God that is unchangeable, immovable, right? Those things never change, right? So we must be careful as, as armchair theologians, which we all are, um, you know, when we think about what this means for God, um, we must not pigeonhole God, thinking that, well, it says this, therefore, you know, that's why we, we must dig in deeper, right, to try to understand what these mean. Uh, and not just look at it on a surface level uh, to say, well, what does it mean that God um, doesn't change? Uh, so anyway, so when we think about God, these are the attributes of God. So from this chapter, we learned that God is love and God is just, right? You cannot have one without the other, right? God is not simply this God who loves but does not bring justice, nor is God a God who simply just hails down justice without love, right? So there is, they go together, right? Justice and love for God go side by side, right? You can't have one without the other, right? To, to love without doing something, you know, at times is, is just a word. Is this mercy? Well, I think mercy love is part of it. justice. I think justice is also... Uh, like righting a wrong. Yeah. So again, justice, we have a concept of justice. Yeah. Well, me, there are many different concepts of justice on our globe, right? It's, this is, we can sit and, and deal with our worldview, right? How we understand justice. No justice on earth matches the justice of God, right? God's justice is very different um, than how we understand justice. Mm -hmm. But God's justice is always 
accompanied with love. Like love is with it, and vice versa. Right? God, you know, God is not just a hippie that that skips around a field. Um, you know, if things are wrong, God moves to fix them. Right? We think about the Beatitudes. Right? That's justice. That's God's justice. It, it's foreign to us to to totally see a reversal of things. Right? One more time, we think of you know, in our worldview, we like things even. Right? Even Stephen, right? So, you know, if you're, you know, we want to say, you know, even rights for everybody, right? But we also have justice. If you do a wrong, you know, you have to, you know, you have to uh, pay for it. And again, and when, when a wrong is done, right, we as Americans like to make sure that the punishment fits the crime, right? If a kid is caught, you know, spray painting graffiti on a wall, you know, we don't, the kid is not sent to the electric chair, right? You might get, you know, 10 hours of community service, you know, scrape that off the wall, don't do it again. And then, of course, if he does it again, maybe, you know, the sentence becomes harsher. But the, the punishment fits the crime, right? God's justice is very different. Um, it's a reversal of things, right? You're poor in this place, you will be rich in my kingdom, right? You've been kicked in the dirt here, you will be elevated in my kingdom, right? So God's justice is more like, this than this, than an evening out. Uh, so when we think, and plus, you know, God's world is not a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, it, it's a kingdom, right? It's a dictatorship. Yeah. A, a, a <laughs> but it's benevolent a benevolent dictatorship. It's a benevolent uh, but it's, theocracy. it's an, you know, autocracy, you know, that's it. Yeah. Yes, it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's so again, it's foreign. To us, especially Americans, you know, where we have held on to our, um, you know, democratic worldview. Uh, we're a republic, but, you know, <coughs> but, you know, this we like. We like having a say. We want to have a say. This is how we're raised from when we're, you know, sprouts. This is who we are. But when we think about God and the Bible, it's very different. It's very different, you know. Um, you know, even the Presbyterian Church kind of works in between like that. You know, we have representative, you know, but it's, we elect elders <coughs> to make decisions, but the elders are not supposed to, you know, act like a politician and, you know, people come to them and say, we don't like this. And so, well, my people say, <laughs> no, you are supposed to vote on how you feel your conscience is led by God, <laughs> Right. Kind of like, you know, well, the United States government, uh, a good deal of it is based on Presbyterian polity. Uh, so we can see some of the similarities uh, with that. So, okay, any questions about justice, love, and God's attributes? You're all experts. No, but I just <laughs> wish I thought, like, run uh, a campaign for my session re-election <laughs> I, I can like pass out but be like, come on if you support me I'll make sure your voice is heard in the right, session right uh, uh, you know I guess it's more of a chicken in every pot I got the lunch chicken in every pot yes, he's down. but I guess that would be anyway you, you know if you made decisions, I can see that happening in some big churches. Yeah, that is that. That wouldn't be. Yeah, that might not be a joke in some churches. Yeah, but it would, that's it right. would have been funny here. That's right. That's that's right. Did, did you hear about the Presbyterian Church in Richmond that closed? Yeah, I read that in the paper. More what than a hundred years old, and it's the most elegant, extravagant yeah, Presbyterian church building. built in Indiana ever. Huh. Built 1904 to 1905. Wow. And it is no members? 40. Dwindled to 40 members. No, I thought it was 30. Is it 30? It was not, well, maybe it is was it too much for that. Is it a church, rural area? But, uh, no, Richmond, Indiana. I don't know. Is that <coughs> like a town, a city? Oh, it, it, it's the birth of jazz in Indiana. It's oh, really famous yeah. for that. But, there's the. Uh, real famous nightclub that everybody thought was in a big city was in Little Richmond, Indiana. I yeah. The name of it. Yeah. You know, unfortunately... The Blue it, Note, I think. They probably couldn't keep up the building. building. I know there's a 
Presbyterian Church, and I think it's Vincennes, that has something like seven members. <coughs> Five of them are on session. <laughs> Two, wow. feel no, no. Two feel left out. <laughs> those, those it, it's more common. It's more common. Um, in seminary now, they, not my group, it, it, but it happened shortly after, they have begun telling people, men and women who enter seminary, that if you're interested in becoming a minister, you know, don't, you might have to consider uh, to be bivocational. Right. Uh, yeah. Because 80% of our churches are small churches. Right. Um, it is what it is. And the Richmond's <laughs> with Erlem Colleges also. Right. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. a lot of things in Richmond. Yeah, this is where David, our, we Bremer? went to school, yeah. Ah, okay. Is the Presbyterian school, Erlem? I don't think so. Or Quaker. I yeah, I think Quaker. it's a Quaker, yeah. Hanover's Presbyterian. Then he went to Princeton, though. So yeah. Uh -huh. That's Presbyterian. Yeah, yeah. Presbyterian, uh, Princeton Seminary? Yeah. 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 All right, so we are now going to embark on an adventure. Because <laughs> now we're going to talk about predestination. Wow, that's what lots, um, of, lots of members. This is this is the one, this is the the chapter that I think will probably be very interesting for many of you, and, and we'll have some good conversations. Um, uh, you know, this is the one that our Wesleyan brothers and sisters always always jive at us, and yep. and we jive back. Um, <coughs> but um, yeah, yeah, and this is what gives us, you know, the nickname, the Frozen Chosen, right? So the the. The chapter heading for this section is, What Does God Want With Us? And I'm going to open up by reading a, a chunk from Guthrie, and in, in it's the beginning of chapter 7 in his book. I've had the absolute conviction, it is much more real than, any, and, than anyone can see or touch, that God and his world exist. And everyone can enter in and find their rest, except me. I'm infinitely, I'm infinitely far away forever. I am alone and apart and infinitely, I can't even read that word. Infinitesimally? That's correct, small. That's the word after that word. Okay. Infinite, how do you say that again? Infinitesimally. <laughs> it's really hard to say. That's a good, no, you said it perfect. Uh, say that again. Infinitesimally. Infinitesimally small. So I guess that's really teeny, right? Thank you. Yeah. Should I do that twice? <laughs> uh, you know, I got lucky to do it once. I could say Worcestershire, and I, that's my claim to fame, right? All right. Um, and I can't come near. Could there be a world, Ralph, in which God existed, but with some people in it who, who are never allowed to believe? It would be a tragic world, said Udall. Why shouldn't it be tragic, Roy cried? Who shouldn't be there... Who shouldn't there be some who are rejected by God from the very beginning? Wait, who are Ralph and Roy? <laughs> <laughs> that is the problem of the doctrine of predestination, expressed in the words of a tormented man in C.P. Snow's novel, The Light and the Dark. Oh, okay. Is God for some people and against others? Has it been decided in advance that some are included and others excluded? Some destined now and forever to life in the fullest sense, and others now and forever to loneliness and death? Is it a tragic world we live in, for some people at least? In this chapter, we will wrestle with this complex problem, which reaches to the heart of everything we believe about God, ourselves, and the world in which we live. Before we begin, we must define the problem more precisely. Contrary to a common misunderstanding, the doctrine of predestination does not say that every good or bad thing that happens to us and in the world around us is predetermined by God, and that we should therefore accept everything that happens as the foreordained will of God. It would be wrong to think of predestination, for instance, if the weather is good or bad on the day of the picnic, or if the traffic lights are for or against us on our way to work and we find or do nothing to find a parking place when we get there. I struggle with that. It would be wrong to think that it must have been predestined 
when someone finds or loses a job, becomes ill, or recovers from an illness, finds or does not find a partner <coughs> in marriage. It would be wrong to think that the favorable or tragic events we read about in the paper or see on the television are the working out of the predestined plan of God for the world. Christians do not understand do, excuse me, Christians do understand all the trivial or momentous events in the little history of every human being and in world history in light of God's loving and just rule over God's good creation. This aspect of Christian faith is interpreted by the doctrine of providence, which we will discuss later. We will discover that providence, too, has nothing to do with a pious version of the fatalistic conviction that what will be, will be. However, the doctrine of predestination is not an attempt to explain how God is related to everything that happens in our own lives and the world around us. According to Scripture, predestination has to do specifically with the question of salvation. Whom does God choose or not choose to love and care in the bad as well as good things that happen to us? To whom does God choose, or not choose, to give the gift of faith that enables people to trust, count on, and live by uh, God's love in sickness and health, in life and death? <clears throat> Who is chosen or not chosen to be included among those to whom the saving grace of God is not only promised, but actually given, so that whatever happens, they find wholeness of life and forever in loving in the God who loves them and in loving others, as they have been loved. Who, in short, does God choose to save or not save? That is the question the doctrine of predestination seeks to answer. In traditional theology, it is called the doctrine of election. Who does God elect to save or not save? That is the question that concerns us in this chapter. This will be our procedure. We will investigate both the strengths and weaknesses of three ways in which Christians have answered the question of the tormented man in Snow's novel. Then we will see what conclusions we can draw for ourselves. All right, so according to Guthrie, predestination is speaking solely about what? Election. Election. Right. So salvation. Election is a more classical way to... So it deals specifically with salvation, right? It's not fatalism. It's not we are marionettes <laughs> that God just makes to dance either, right? So we do have abilities, you know, we live our lives. We make decisions. Uh, some good, some not so good. A whole handful of neutral. Um, but we are not predestined to do things throughout our lives. Um, he uses examples like traffic lights, mm -hmm. finding parking spots. Um, you know, I've talked to some people, uh, you know, and you say, well, w where do you draw the line? You know, are you predestined to wear those blue socks over the red socks? <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously. I mean, so, you know, theologically, remember, theology is very logical. Yeah. So, you know, you build on it like you would with logic or, or, or mathematics, and maybe that's why Pascal yeah. found himself as a, a neat theologian, being a mathematician. Mm -hmm. But it specifically speaks about salvation, right? The other things, you know, traffic lights, parking spots, when you go to the mall around Christmas time, you know, this has nothing to do with predestination. Uh, <coughs> So when we speak about predestination, it is only speaking about salvation, right? So that's, that's the ground rule that Guthrie lays out to start the discussion. Now, from, and I've never read uh, this book, The Light and the Dark, but this is very common when you deal with talking about predestination. This, this thought pattern, it's just cruel. It's, you know, how could, how could this be? And these are the things that we're going to tackle as we go to this chapter. Um, yes? And by salvation, we mean going to heaven afterwards. So really, nobody yes. of us knows 100% if we're saved or not. We think we know, but... 
Well, I, th this part of predestination also. I mean, this is my, my question. Yeah, yeah. I, it it deals with it deals with salvation. Yes, it deals with you know who is called, or who is chosen. So I cannot say, for example, that Hitler was not saved. I, mean, I, I don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, theologically, yes. Um, <coughs> even though I think we can all deduct, um, yeah, but, uh, use deduction to try to figure yeah. out, you know. Um, yes, it means that when we We'll go deeper into it, um, but yes, it deals with that. It deals with who is called, um, and Guthrie will build this this argument or build his case for predestination or not predestination by looking at uh, different ways that it's been interpreted throughout uh, the history of Reformed theology. So he's gonna we're gonna look at examples from the Hebrew Scriptures. And the New Testament, both. Because this concept of calling or choosing has been around a long, long time. So it's not just that Jesus pops on the scene and now, you know, says, okay, I choose you to be saved. Um, you know, so what we're going to see is that this concept of calling or choosing or electing has been going on for a long time. All right, we see it from the very beginning. Right, in which ways do we see it from the beginning in the Hebrew Scriptures? Israel's chosen as. That's right. Right. Start with Israel's chosen. Israel isn't. You know, Abraham is called out. Right. Yeah. right. Abraham is chosen. He's he said, "You, my faithful Chaldean." you now are chosen and you're going to move westward. <laughs> I'm going to give you a tract of land. Mm -hmm. Now, Abraham is chosen. His son, Isaac, is chosen over Ishmael. Jacob is chosen <coughs> over Esau. And I always feel bad for Esau. Yeah. Esau pulls on my heartstrings. I just feel for that guy. I yeah. feel for that guy. He's just all brawn but not necessarily bad, right? Joseph is chosen over his brothers, and, right? And the chosen, what we now may think, is an immortal way. I mean, mm. doesn't Jacob try to, uh, to play a trick on his father to get... Oh, he does play a trick yeah, on his yeah, father. So, right. so, oh, yeah. so it's, not, it's not the chosen, you know, angels that chosen. You know, he goes and plays tricks on his father to become chosen, so to speak, you know, he... He puts the, the yeah <coughs> yes you know the the, the goat's the skin on him and his yeah. father is blind. He takes it, so he gives it to him and he thinks it's Esau. Yeah, so so really it's <coughs> yeah. In that case, yes. <coughs> in that case, yes. So, but is he chosen? Bef you know, is he called out? Yeah. And that's where you know theology yeah, comes in, right? right. Where yeah. does that happen? Um, Israel is chosen. Um, now, you fast forward into the New Testament. So Jesus is walking along the shorelines and Peter and John and Andrew and James say, hey, you know, we heard you talking to Town Square. You know, we, we're going to follow you. Is that how it worked? Mm, no. How did it work? No. Yeah. Me. Jesus chose them. Right. Yeah. Right. So this concept. But he also chose Judas. He did choose Judas. Yeah. Most definitely. Uh, and, and, that, and that one is a total theological bird's nest because yeah. when we think about it, you know, was he chosen specifically because he knew yeah. that he would betray him? You know, well, Jesus... I mean, I don't think... I mean, I think... I mean, Jesus knew that he wasn't going to live out a happy old-aged life <laughs> except in The Last Temptation of Christ, the movie. Right. Um, <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> but, uh... That's right. Um, so, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I yeah? think it's totally uh, plausible that he's like, okay, i got to get one more guy, and he's going to have to betray me. I'm going to need a weak link. <laughs> right. I'm going to need somebody that's going to buckle under pressure. <laughs> right. Who's it going to be? Um, so, you know, but yes. So when we think about how God has maneuvered throughout the Hebrew Scriptures and within the New Testament, we see... The, the foundation for this concept of choosing, right? It's there. You cannot ignore this, right? God has chosen throughout, um, you know, 
the Israelites chose Saul, right? And that became a fiasco. But then who chose David? God chose David, right? So, and not to say David was perfect either, um, but David, you know, was a more uh, suitable ruler, right? So when we think about this concept of choice and choosing and calling, right? Sometimes we'll call it a calling or, you know, choosing, um, but God does call out. Uh, so this example is literally littered throughout the Bible. It's all over the place. It's all over the place. Um, I remember, and I'm going to leave you with this, and then we will pick up next week. We'll begin with the, with the classical interpretations of predestination. When I was in, at Columbia, they typically would have, uh, like in theology, we would have two professors. You would have the main professor, and then you would have the associate professor, and both would teach the lesson, right? And so my first uh, semester in Theo, uh, I had, we had the main professor, but then we had a professor from Germany. And um, so we were talking about predestination, right? We started to, we started to crack that egg. And, of course, you could see, you know, in, my, in the classroom, not everyone there are, are Presbyterian. So, you know, you have the majority of people at Columbia were Presbyterian, but then you also had people from all different, you know, denominations, some non-denominational, you know, they're, you know, probably like at every seminary, right? So the, the, the professor from Germany, she said, she spoke up, and she said, you know, I'll tell you why you Americans have a problem with predestination. She said, because you were raised ever since you were small and taught to be fiercely independent, right? You are, you know, these are my rights, my abilities, I do it, right? You're very individualistic. Uh, she wasn't saying this is an insult. This is an observation. She said, in Germany, we don't have a problem with this concept of predestination, God chooses, that's it. <laughs> you're in, cool. That's it. If you're not in, you don't you don't care anyway. You're not going to church. What do you you know? You don't care. You don't care. So when she said that, it was like a bomb went off in the classroom. Of like, you know, some people got angry. You know, how dare you? How dare you know? But I sat back and I thought about it, and and she's right. Because no matter where you sit on the spectrum, as an American, we are all raised with this, with this fire of being fiercely independent, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, we make, you can do whatever you want if you work hard enough, right? The, the dream is, is put in all of us. And to have someone say, even theologically, you don't have a choice in something. What do you mean I don't have a choice in something? <gasps> So there is this, it's a conflict of worldviews, is what she was trying to say. Right. Right. She was saying the worldview is different. Therefore, you have an issue because it's, it's friction. It's moving against the grain. And so what she's saying is we, you have to move past your 21st century North American worldview, excuse me, to understand a worldview that goes back 5,000 years in the Middle East, where there is no democracy, right? Again, it was all kings and queens. So what you have to do, different culture, you have to take yourself out of this understanding and place yourself in a totally different worldview. And that's the challenge. And that's the challenge. So, and it's not just predestination, but, you know, there are many different things that come from us from the Bible that are challenging to us. And it's not just to us. I'm not, you know, just picking on my own worldview, but any worldview. I could say, I talk about my worldview because it's the worldview I live in, right? But if you have someone who lives in China or Brazil or Australia, you know, or, you know, or the Congo, it's, it's, that's the worldview you live in. So you will have to deal with your own friction as you try to grasp a concept of something that's over 5,000 years old. So we can see where this, this friction happens, right? So as we study this, keep in mind 
that we wear 21st century North American spectacles. Why do you say five? Th I mean, well, predestination, I think of Calvin. Well, yes. I'm talking about the beginning of the Bible. Okay. So, yeah, no, no. Calvin, <laughs> he's old. He's not that old. Um, uh, yes. But, um, so I'm talking about the Bible itself. Because um, Calvin, of course, looks back and he is just, you know, he creates the concept from what he reads. Right. Uh, right. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Thank you all. And we will pick up next week.